Good morning, everyone. It's Russ Barkley, and because it's going to be a very hot weekend here in Richmond, nearing 100 degrees over the next couple of days, I thought it's time to break out the bright tropical shirts. So I uh, hope it's not too uh, bright for you this morning. We have just a couple of dad jokes because I've got a lot of research to cover this morning, so let's just do a few of them and get on with it. Uh, first of all, these come to us from the website Delish. Dot com. And your first dad joke is, when two vegans get in an argument, is it still called a beef? Uh, <laughs> okay, think about this one, however. Do you want a box for your leftovers? No, but I'll wrestle, wrestle you for them. Excuse me, almost blew that one. Uh, and finally, uh, here's your last dad joke. The car looks nice, but the muffler seems exhausted. Oh, that is so bad. I know you're groaning. So, all right, let's get started with the six research articles I want to talk about this morning. The first one up comes to us from the British Journal of Psychiatry, and it's a, uh, a very small study in the sense that it just looked at a few variables, but it's assessing people on the internet using an internet-based survey device and it has 715 respondents, and they're looking at the relationship of ADHD symptoms, ADHD diagnosis, and the reports of provisional premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD as it's called in the DSM uh, diagnostic manual. So this study is assessing women who are 18 to 34 years of age. As I said, there are 715 of them who filled out the survey and completed the ADHD symptom rating scales, the PMDD symptom rating scales, and then also reported whether or not they had received a clinical diagnosis of ADHD. And what did they find in the study? The prevalence of PMDD was significantly elevated in individuals with a self-reported clinical diagnosis of ADHD. About 32% of them reported that disorder versus about 10% in the control group. So about three to three and a half times greater risk for PMDD in those with a diagnosis. It also looked at individuals who were classified as ADHD using the online ADHD symptom rating scale. Their rate of PMDD was about 41%, again being about four times greater than was seen in the control group. Overall, they found that having ADHD with depression or with anxiety provided the highest risk for provisional PMDD and that was about a four and a half times greater risk than was seen in the control group. Overall, this is yet another study that shows that when ADHD occurs in women, it may worsen their menstrual symptoms, in this case, their provisional premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Okay, so I just thought you'd be interested in that because there's so little that's done on this topic, and I've talked about it in a prior video, that any study adds further to the evidence that we have available on these problems. All right, the next journal article up is a review. This comes to us from the journal Neurodiversity, and it's a meta-analysis of studies of parent training programs and their effects on child ADHD symptoms, quality of life, and parent-child related outcomes. Now, other reviews have been done of this literature, and they have reported that there were no significant effects of parent training on ADHD symptoms specifically, and what little there were didn't seem to last very long. Mainly, there were changes on parent reports of their parenting and their uh, parenting self-concept. So that's the background. This particular meta-analysis identified seven studies that were randomized controlled trials that were measuring these symptoms. And what does it find? It said that there was no significant effect of these parent training programs on most of the measures. There was a small effect on ADHD symptoms, but it was short-lived 
and it was not backed up when they looked at blinded reports of improvements in the children. So the effect here was pretty minimal or non-existent on these outcomes. The authors point out that while there is some evidence that parent training might improve parental stress and self-efficacy in the short term, the effects on parental behaviors are mixed and one can draw very limited conclusions. So this is yet another review that shows that behavioral parent training isn't really very effective for ADHD. Then why do we do it? Because there is substantial evidence that it improves childhood conduct problems, oppositional behavior, and childhood aggression, not to mention parent-child conflict. That's why we recommend it. It's for those families that have ADHD children that are particularly oppositional and defiant and where there's a lot of parent-child conflict. So on the one hand, parent training programs don't seem to be beneficial for ADHD specifically. On the other hand, they are of some benefit for helping to manage oppositional and defiant behavior in children. So just thought you ought to know about that. Next paper up comes to us from the journal that is Pediatric and Perinatal Epidemiology. It's a study on early neonatal infections and the later risk for ADHD and autism spectrum in those young children. This is a nationwide cohort study. It involves, as I'll show you here, over 980,000 children were assessed in this study, and they identified a little over 8,000 had developed sepsis during the neonatal period, and another 152 had developed meningitis. So they took a look at these children to see if they had elevated rates of ADHD and autism. And what they found is that both disorders were linked to both kinds of infection. However, when they controlled using sibling matched comparisons for the genetic and family environment contributions to ADHD, there was no link of sepsis to ADHD at all. However, the link with autism spectrum disorder particularly involving early meningitis, remained. And they found that point estimates suggested that children who had been exposed or developed meningitis had increased risk for both ADHD and ASD, but particularly for ASD. So what you're seeing here then, as the authors conclude, is that early onset sepsis was associated with an increased probability of later autism spectrum disorder, but any association with ADHD appeared to be the result of familial confounding. It's not related to the infection. So I thought you might want to know that very nice study that attempts to control for some of the family influences in ADHD, particularly family genetic influences. Study number four that I want to cover with you is a study that comes to us from European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and it's a review of the effectiveness of game-based digital interventions on ADHD. There's a lot of advertising going on out there promoting these kinds of game-based treatments for ADHD. So this is a good review. It's a meta-analysis, and it is looking at a total of eight randomized controlled trials. And while it did find that there was some significant improvements on lab measures of certain cognitive functions, there was little, if any, improvement on behavior in natural settings, including inhibition and executive functioning, suggesting that the improvements in the measures given in the lab likely occur because they're similar to the games themselves. But there's little, if any, evidence of generalization to real-world behavior. So, in other words, a fairly negative review of game-based interventions for ADHD. And that, of course, parallels my own opinion over the years that where 
treatment effects are found for these games, they're pretty much on lab measures given by the investigators that are often similar to the kinds of games that were being played. Okay, so that's our fourth study. Paper number five this morning was published over in the journal Progress in Neuro, excuse me, Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry. This is an interesting paper because it goes along with more than 33 earlier studies that I've talked about on the possibility that taking stimulant medication over several years might improve brain growth in regions of the brain that underlie ADHD. And while this is typically not found in all individuals, it is found in a significant minority of them, and all of those earlier papers reported significant group differences between the medicated group and the unmedicated group in brain growth. So here's a longitudinal fMRI study that is looking at children who started on methylphenidate, assesses them with fMRI, and then reassesses them several years later. And the study reports that they had, not, excuse me, 89 individuals with ADHD, 91 typically developing control children. They assessed the children's brain structures using MRI, and then they reassessed the children several years later after a subset of them had been exposed to methylphenidate over that period of time. So what did they find? They found that the increased cumulative dosage of methylphenidate was associated with increased gray matter volumes in several areas of the frontal cortex, as well as in the uh, rostral middle frontal cortex and in the paracentral area, among others. So there were at least six or seven brain regions in which they found brain growth as a result of these children taking medication. However, they found that this was principally in the children who had taken medication before age 12 years, whereas children who had started medication after 12 years of age did not seem to show such significant cortical development from taking methylphenidate. So here we have yet another study suggesting that at least for certain age groups of children, taking stimulant medication may help improve brain growth within certain brain regions. My last study to discuss this morning was published over in Biological Psychiatry and Cognitive Neuroscience and Neuroimaging. This is a very complex study. I'm going to try to summarize it very briefly for you, but essentially these investigators looked at 394 children with ADHD, about a thousand control children, and they assess them using functional MRI. They also have genetic data on these individuals, and they have the results of various lab tests of attention and inhibition collected on these children. Now, what are they doing? They are looking at activity in several areas of the brain. They're linking that activity up with significant gene components that are mainly involved with immunoglobulin, taste reception, and immunity-related terms. And they're also looking at the overlap of those genes with ADHD. Now, they found that the brain activity in these regions they were monitoring, the cortex, the cerebellum, and the nucleus accumbens, was significantly associated with some genetic components that they had assessed in these children, including some that overlap with previously identified ADHD genes. Then they linked the two together, the neural activity and the gene, genes that they were identifying, and they correlated those, and they looked at the fMRI gene correlates and found that they were significantly linked to degree of inattention and degree of disinhibition 
in these children. This is one of the few studies now that's linking brain activity with genetics for neural pathways and other aspects of functioning, including ADHD genes, and then linking that up with cognitive and behavioral measures. Very interesting study there, very complicated study as well. Okay, that's it for this morning. I hope you found these papers informative. I certainly did. And I hope you'll join me again next weekend for another research review. And as always, in the meantime, think about becoming a subscriber. And until then, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now. Thanks.